air and in this lesson we're going to look at circadian rhythm management. I would consider this the foundational piece in terms of physical and environmental health. So this is an excellent starting point. If you don't have circadian rhythm management happening, optimize, it will impact every other aspect of your health. So what does circadian rhythm even mean? What is it? Well, there's processes in the body, peak hormone timings, where the body is turning on certain hormones, turning off certain hormones during a 24-hour period. There are also metabolic processes and cellular processes that are being switched on and off by genes in the body. And these genes are called clock genes. You could see some clock genes um, and when they're happening in this diagram. So for example, at 9 p.m. in the evening, melatonin starts being produced. Early in the morning, you want high cortisol and high testosterone to support you to get ready for your day. Our genes know when to turn on or off these processes from signals from our environment. And it's these environmental signals that are within your control. You have the power to change your environment, thereby optimizing your clock genes and optimizing your health. Scientists are coming to conclude that light signaling and circadian rhythm management is as important, if not more important, than diet and exercise for health. Although it does affect sleep significantly, circadian rhythm management is so much more than just getting eight hours of sleep each night. The typical clinical prescription that practitioners, doctors often give is to get your eight hours of sleep. And that really has become a throwaway statement. We're going to go much deeper than that. So circadian rhythm influences all these aspects in your body. All this to say, it is possible to rebalance your hormones and heal adrenal fatigue solely by adjusting your circadian rhythm. It's actually these lifestyle changes that give you the long-lasting benefits. The highest levels of cortisol happen around 6 a.m. Cortisol decreases over the course of the day until it reaches its lowest point in the evening before bed. Now, if you have the opposite pattern happening, low in the morning, high at night, you probably have insomnia. Testosterone and cortisol essentially give us the umph to get on with our day or get a bingo. Adiponectin is a hormone that's responsible for energy metabolism. It's highest around 1 p.m. It's helping with cellular metabolism all that time of the day. Um, leptin is one that suppresses appetite, it peaks in the evening, which makes sense. You don't need to be eating when you're sleeping. Melatonin starts to rise as cortisol wanes. It prepares our body for sleep. It's also one of the most potent antioxidants. GH is growth hormone. Uh, this is how your body rejuvenates itself at night. TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid disorders can be really a circadian rhythm disorder. I mean, think about people that have insomnia. The signal to produce TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, isn't getting to the clock genes. So the TSH isn't going to get switched on. Ghrelin triggers appetite and hunger. RAAS, RAS, relates to kidney function and blood pressure. I don't really want to get too technical. It's more to show you that there are so many important functions our hormones are carrying out over the course of the day. And perhaps even more importantly, how each of these hormones is ruled by circadian rhythm. Okay, so there's four environmental signals that influence circadian rhythm. Light, food, temperature, and physical activity. Okay, so think about our modern lifestyles for a moment. Cold at night, warmer temperatures during the day support sleep. We are inundated by heat and air conditioning in our homes, our cars, our workplaces. Our bodies never have a chance to experience those natural temperature timings and modulations. Another thing, we have fast food restaurants and diners open 24 hours a day. People eat whenever they want. If you think back to our ancestors, they didn't have that luxury. They would eat according to the time of the day, gather their food, cook their food when there was that light source available to do so. Then we have our sedentary lifestyle that numbs the cues as well. Naturally, we should be more active during the day, less active during the night. Now, how many people are exercising after work when it's dark? Perhaps the biggest one of all is light pollution, though. We're not getting enough blue light during the day, 
and we're getting too much blue light at night. We talk about this in the light section of the environment module. Think about candlelight or campfire light before electricity. Everything would have gone orange in the evening. Now we have blue light from our TVs, our cell phones, our tablets, our readers, etc. This is a major reason why people are getting sick. So this is the spectrum of light. If you look at daylight, we want this big portion of blue light. Blue light stimulates, it tells the body, raise your cortisol levels, it's time to be outside, to be busy, to be active, more aroused. If you're working in an office with fluorescent, incandescent lights, or halogen lights, there's hardly any blue light. So you're not going to get the full spectrum of blue light. Blue light decreases depression. It lifts our energy. The opposite happens in the evening. We don't want blue anymore. We want red. Red light is destimulating. It's calming. It prepares us for sleep. Most people have too much exposure to cool white LED lighting in the evening. They're watching TV, looking at their cell phones or tablets, and they're getting blue light, which is wrong for the time of day. You then don't have the necessary signal to your brain and hormones telling them, hey, it's time to relax and prepare for sleep. This is um, a, a diagram showing some diagrams from a study that was done that looked specifically at how circadian rhythm imbalances influence and can trigger thyroid disorders. All right, so what can you do about it? I want to give you 10 steps, 10 steps that are practical, actionable, they don't cost very much, and they could literally be life-changing. So let's get into these steps. Number one, go to bed at 9 between 9 and 9.30 p.m. This brings everything forward and in alignment with our natural rhythms. Just doing this one step aligns your awake sleep cycle with natural earth rhythms. Any productivity or time you think you're going to lose by being in bed earlier will be made up by naturally waking up earlier. You'll be more productive, not less. Now, some guidance if you do wake up during the night, stay in bed with all the lights off, resting, using meditation music if you need to, to fall back asleep. If you become stressed lying in bed, it is best to get up, but keep all the lights off or simply use red orange lighting. You can buy amber light bulbs now or use candlelight or use blue blocking glasses to stim the light exposure. Avoid blue light as that will wake you up even more. Step number two, is to get bright light for 30 minutes in the first th 30 minutes upon waking. So get outside whenever you can, even if it's cloudy out, there's still sunlight. Ideally, this is gonna be sunlight that we're talking about. If sunlight is not available, you know, if for whatever reason you can't get outside, you can get a 10,000 lux SAD or sad lamp, which you could sit about eight to 24 inches away from and receive that light source. You can use it again around noon or even throughout the day. Again, ideally this is all sunlight exposure, but if you have to, you can invest in one of those side lamps. The first 30 minutes upon waking is most critical. Okay, so light sessions, going outdoors or with the light box if you have to, can be done in five to 10 minute intervals throughout the day to boost energy further. So think of it as microdosing. You're microdosing your light exposure. Compared to your average cup of coffee or energy drink, there is simply no contest. The effects from a 30 minute morning light shower are much more powerful, longer lasting, and more far, far reaching. So quick tip here, you want to get over, um, if you wanna get over cravings or addictions, say, you know, to alcohol or sugar, the light showers that I just talked about are one of the best ways to do just that. They will help with um, overcoming addiction. Step number three is to block up blue light from household light bulbs, TVs, computers, cell phones after sunset. So this step alone can sometimes be enough to cure insomnia. I've seen it countless clients. An easy way to do this is to switch out your light bulbs to red or orange bulbs. Sometimes they're called amber light bulbs or use candlelight or firelight when it gets dark. 
So after the sun goes down, consider wearing blue blocking glasses if you are going to have any blue light exposure. Put the glasses on two to three hours before bed. There's also software for phones and computers. One's called Flux. Uh, you can use that to turn the screen orange. And you can download that at justgetflux.com. Again, I wouldn't rely on the apps or the blue blocking glasses. I would just avoid the blue light as much as you can. Step number four is to have complete darkness at night while you sleep. So our ancestors would have had moonlight, so it may not be necessary to like have your blue, your room, your bedroom completely blacked out. However, darkness is important. Consider getting black light curtains for your bedroom, test those out. A good rule of thumb is that you shouldn't be able to see your hand in front of your face. That's how dark it should be. Especially if you have street lamps outside your window, the black light curtains are gonna be a good investment. Even just five lux of light can be too much. So check around your bedroom for other light sources, from, for example, from your alarm clock. You know, does it emit any light? Um, night lights, you know, if you can do away with the lights or cover them, that's ideal. A sleep mask is another option. Um, night lights, even like the red ones, are not a good idea to have on all night or in the bedroom. Light sources anywhere in your house should only be used while you are awake. So like a nightlight in the bathroom, for example, an amber nightlight, of course, sure. When you go to sleep, you should turn off all the light sources though. Um, tip number five is to fast for at least three hours before bed. So eat around five to six. Stop eating after dinner or supper, depending on what you call that meal of the day. Get your blue blocking glasses on at sunset your body is preparing to wind down for sleep. You want to support that to happen. Your last bite of food should occur no closer than three hours before bed. Late night eating blunts circadian rhythm, it disrupts sleep, and it degrades your energy levels. It basically makes you fatter over time. Okay, so remember autophagy. That's uh, a process that helps to break down and eliminate dead cells in our body. That essential process depends upon this fasting window that does not take place if you are not fasting. Now, if you're, so, if you're someone that finds themselves feeling hungry before bed, try increasing your total calories during the day to prevent waking up or feeling hungry before bed. Have a bigger lunch, have a bigger supper. If you're waking up in the night feeling hungry or anxious with low blood sugar, that's an entirely separate issue. That's a sign of poor metabolic health. And there are dietary strategies to help with that that we're gonna look at in the vitality vessel or the body module. Now for now, transition slowly to eating less and less close to bedtime. So transition 30 minutes at a time, for example, slowly over days and weeks if you need to. And if you have blood sugar issues, it's imperative not to do that all at once. You do it gradually. Step number six is to time the bulk of your daily activity during daylight hours. So be active during the day. Try to work out during daylight hours. Don't exercise a few hours before bed or after it gets dark. Movement and activity is synergistic with the other triggers, light temperature and food timing. It amplifies the circadian signal. Intense exercise should be done during the daytime, i.e. when the sun is out, to reinforce that daytime signal. The same as you don't want bright light at night, you also don't want intense exercise at night. So avoid exercise within four hours of going to bed. That's a good idea. Exercising around 5 p.m. can sometimes be ideal for sleep for some people, depending on their chronotype. However, don't exercise at 9 p.m. and then go to sleep at 11 p.m. Long term, that is not going to be good for you. For most people, the best time to exercise is in the morning, especially if there is a health goal of weight loss that you're trying to achieve. Step number uh, seven is get your temperature right. So what do I mean by that? Colder temperatures are a signal for nighttime and trigger sleepiness. Warmer temperatures are a signal for daytime and trigger wakefulness. So cold in the morning can switch on your body's heater. 
heat in the late evening followed by getting out of the bath shower sauna can cause a drop in temperature which triggers sleep so it seems a little paradoxical or counterintuitive but you want to have your cold shower in the morning and your warm bath in the evening being in too cool of an environment during the day for example like always being indoors in air conditioning and too warm an environment at night will blunt your circadian rhythm you should have a large change in temperature between your daytime temperature and your nighttime temperature if you want to optimize your metabolic health and energy levels. Tip number eight is to start your day with movement. We want to increase what's called cyclic AMP right after waking up. Cyclic AMP is an important cellular signaling molecule that resets the circadian rhythm and helps tell the brain that it's daytime. The physical activity doesn't have to be intense. It could look like yoga or tai chi, qigong, stretching, light exercise, walking is actually best if your metabolic health is poor or you're already feeling fatigued. So you should feel better after the physical movement, not drained or burnt out. Step number nine is to use sound to entrain circadian rhythm. The calls of songbirds influences circadian rhythm. It's a human animal co-evolution. There's actually science papers out about this. Hearing birds singing in the morning helps you wake up. So how do you apply that? Wake up with a gentle, soothing noise that you like or the sounds of songbirds if you know, you're know you lucky enough to have them outside your home. Then shift into music that energizes you. At night, in the few hours leading to bed, keep the volume of any noise relatively low. And finally, step number 10, routine. Routines are powerful ways to entrain your circadian rhythm. Create a lifestyle plan, stick to the routine, exercise on a schedule, eat on a schedule, get in bed on a schedule, sleep on a schedule, wake up on a schedule. Literally block these off on your schedule. It's about creating rhythm, creating consistency. The body then comes to expect these activities at those specific times. And there is power in the simple act of getting yourself on a schedule in how your day unfolds. And that's one of the ways that you can take back control of your health is creating that schedule for yourself. Doing the same things at the same times of day and trains your, phys your physiology to do those things, to expect that. Constantly shifting things around, you know, variation, <laughs> blunt circadian rhythm and energy. So your hormones, remember, your hormones are listening to you. <laughs>